I'm concluding the series I started several weeks ago, and this is part seven of it. It's the father and his household. The father and his household, and this is part seven, and my subtitle is Children. We started talking about the father and his household. We talked about Eden. We talked about outcasts. We talked about our friends. We talked about the servants. We talked about the tabernacle. We've talked about the last Adam, which we did last week. And today, we are concluding the finale of it, children. And in this series, which I believe is a very uh, important study in God's dealing with mankind, we have looked at how God has dealt with man from the Garden of Eden up till now, and the various relationships he has sustained with us. And I said from the beginning that God's relationship with us will determine what we receive from him or what we can take from him. The fact that we are all alive does not mean we have the same relationship with God. And it doesn't mean that throughout history, people have had the same relationship with God. So today, we're looking at children uh, in the last phase of that relationship. When God started dealing with man in the Garden of Eden after man sinned and fell, he promised in Genesis chapter 3 verse 15 that the seed of the woman shall come to bruise the head of the serpent. And throughout different types and shadows in the Old Testament, he showed that a Messiah was going to come. And then he also used the prophets to announce the coming of the Messiah. And there were all kinds of indications given about one who would come who would fix the problem of mankind. In this last session, we're going to do a lot of study in the gospel according to St. John. So I'm going to stay a lot in John, although I'll flip in and out of John, but much of what I'll say is going to be based on the book of John. So let's start our study today from John chapter 1, verse 1 to 3. It's a passage I have referenced several times uh, in my message, but we are going to look at it a little bit closer than it has been in previous times. John chapter 1, verse 1 to 3. And we read these majestic words. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through Him, and without Him, nothing was made that was made. One of the first things you will notice about this passage is the use of him in reference to word. Now, normally when we talk about word, a word is not a him. Your word is an it. But in this passage, the word is a him. The word is a person. It's a personality. The Greek word that is translated as word and we always go to the Greek because the New Testament was written originally in Greek. And so the original meaning of the word is very important to your understanding. The Greek word that is translated word is a, a Greek word logos. Logos. The Greek word logos uh, means a word that is uttered by a living voice. A word that is uttered by a living voice. It is that by which an inner thought is revealed. It reveals an inner thought. So wherever there is word, there is thought. But thought cannot express itself unless there is a word. So in a theological context, the word is God's living word to us. It's a passing and that person is Jesus. It's God's living word. God's logos. In the beginning was the logos. And the logos was with God. And the logos was God. There are several things that I want to bring your attention to in this passage. The first thing 
is that the Logos is eternal. He is eternal. The Word is in the beginning. In the beginning was the Word. The Word is not an afterthought. He is not an entity that shows up later in time. The Word is eternal. Whatever or whenever the beginning was, the Word was. The Word was in the beginning. The Word is eternal. So this word is not just something that shows up later in time. This word has a pre-existence in eternity. Secondly, the word is relational. Relational. Why do I say that? Because the Bible says the word was with God. With God. So there is a relationship there. That phrase, with God, establishes a relationship. Although in the Bible you will never find the word Trinity written in the Bible. Anywhere in the Bible you will not find the word Trinity. But the idea, the concept, the doctrine of the Trinity is established throughout the Bible. From Genesis when God says, let us make man in our image. Right up to here where he says the word was with God. You see a relationship. There is a Godhead and there is a relationship in the Godhead. So, there is relationship. That's very important. Third, the word is divine. And that is the boldest statement probably in the whole uh, statement. And the word is God. The word is not with God as an angel or some other heavenly being. The word is with God as God. The word is not a man. The word is divine. The word is God. Everybody say the word is God. And this establishes one of the major foundations of the Christian faith. Jesus is not just a great teacher, a great philosopher, a good man, a nice man, a founder of a religion. Jesus is God. God himself, God in the flesh. So, the word is God, divinity. So, he's eternal, he's relational, he is divine. Now, when you look at the first three statements that uh, John chapter 1 verse 1 makes, those statements have nothing to do with man or with creation. It has to do with what existed before the universe and man came on the scene. So when you read in the beginning was the word and the word was a God and the word was God, it says nothing about man. It doesn't even say anything about creation. It doesn't say anything about what we have now. It says everything about what existed before the universe came into being. So this is heavy. In the beginning was the word. The word was with God. The word is God. He was in the beginning with God. But then when you read verse 3, it shifted from what existed before creation to creation. So we realize in verse 3 that all things were made by him. By who? The word. All things were made by the word. So the word is not just divine. It's not just eternal. It's not just relational. The word is a creator. All things were made by the Word. So creation is a product of the Word. When we read the passage, God said, let there be. It is the Word in action. Because that is the Word that brings things into being. Now when you read the Bible and you read from Genesis chapter 1, you read the phrase, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth, and then the next phrase says, and the earth is without form. Now that first stanza, in the beginning God created the heaven and the earth, the Bible doesn't tell us when that happens. And it doesn't tell us how it happened. What you read from Genesis chapter 1 downwards is how the earth was prepared for man. But before that happened, there had been a creation. The heavens, everything had already been created. Then God focused on the earth and prepared it for man. That's what you see in Genesis. But what brought all of that into being? The heavens, the planets, 
the galaxies, the, all the, the huge manifestation of the universe, they came because of the word. So this word is awesome. It's not just some weak little word speaking. It's just the power that brings everything into manifestation. And then in Genesis chapter 1, we see the word and how he creates. Let there be light. Let there be firmament. Let us make. That is the word in action. In the beginning is the word. The word is God. The word is God. The word is creator. So I want you for a moment to ponder the magnificence of this being that is called the word. He's not just a sound. He's eternal. He's a creator. He's holy. He's just. He's true. He's God. Then, as we read John chapter 1, we find that this word had to do something because, you know, the word is the one who said, let us make man in our image. That is the word. So, the initiator and the one who produced this is the word. The word, let us make man. Let there be. That's the word in action. So, when man is lost, if man is lost, if man sins, if man is a castaway, if man loses his relationship with God, it stands to reason that the word has to be involved in redeeming the man because the word actually brought the man into existence. So the word has to pursue the man who is lost. The difficulty is the word is spirit. You can't see him. He's, he's spirit. He's a person, but he's a spirit being. And the word has to come and save man. So how is the word going to do that? So in verse 14 of John chapter 1, something very interesting happens to the word. The word which is spirit, which is eternal, which is the creator, steps into a new dimension of operation. John chapter 1 verse 14 says, And the word became flesh. And dwelt amongst us. And we beheld his glory. Whose glory? The glory of the word. The glory as of the only begotten of the father. Full of grace and truth. This is a very profound statement. The word. This thing that creates everything. That is eternal. That pre-existed the universe. Now becomes flesh. The word became flesh. When he became flesh, he's still the word. But he's the word now with flesh. What does that mean? It means several things. One, that the word took on human form. The word took on human form. The word was born. He was clothed with the same material as human beings are clothed in. Human beings have flesh and blood. The word took on flesh and blood. He took on human form. Philippians says it so well that he humbled himself and became a man and died. The word took on human form. Secondly, it means that the word became God's only begotten son. The word became God's only begotten son. He became a son when he took on flesh. Before he took on the flesh, he was not a son. He was the word. But the word became God's son when he took on flesh. So he became a son for a purpose. It is a redemptive relationship. And we'll, we'll go into that later. In the first Adam, God put his spirit into man. In the case of the last Adam, God became the man. So he didn't just put his spirit, he became the man. He put on flesh and became the only begotten of the father, the begotten son. The third thing is that the word lived amongst men. The Bible says he dwelt amongst us. The word experienced human life. He dwelt amongst us. He was not a phantom. He was not an illusion. He was not a concept he was a real historical being. 
He lived as a human with a date of birth and a census record. Jesus is not just an idea. Jesus is an actual human recorded being. The word became flesh and dwelt amongst us. Isaiah had said his name will be called Emmanuel, God with us. So when the word was dwelling amongst us, God was mingling with his creation. He didn't just create us, he mingled with us. He stood where we stood, experienced where we experienced, so he can lift us to his level. The word experienced human life. And fourthly, the word revealed God in human form. John says, we beheld his glory. We beheld his glory. If, if you wanted to see God, you saw the word. In John chapter 14, verse 8 and 9, Jesus had a discussion with one of his disciples called Philip. And the Bible says, records it and says, Philip said to him, Lord, show us the Father and it is sufficient for us. Jesus said to him, have I been with you so long and yet you have not known me, Philip? He who has seen me has seen the Father. So how can you say, show us the Father? What Jesus is saying is, if you want to see how the Father operates, look at me. If you see me, you see in physical form what the Father is in spirit form. What I do in the physical is what the Father is always doing in the spirit. In the spirit, you don't see it, but in the physical, you see it. So I came to show you the invisible God, his compassion, his power, his goodness, his ability. If you want to know God, you look at the God in the flesh, Jesus. The word became flesh and dwelt amongst us. Galatians 4, 5, and, uh, 5 and 4, 4 and 5 says, When the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law, that he might receive, that we might receive the adoption as sons. God sent his son, born of a woman, born under the law. That talks about the humanity and the legitimacy of Christ. Now, the word pre-existed us. The word is divine. The word created everything. The word became flesh. I want you to follow this closely because this is profound. The word became flesh. The word dwelt amongst us. When people saw him, they were looking at God in flesh manifestation. Then you go to John chapter 3, verse 16. John chapter 3, verse 16. Jesus has a conversation with a theologian by the name of Nicodemus. Nicodemus was a theologian, a Jewish theologian. And uh, he believed the prophecies of the Messiah. He saw Jesus, heard Jesus, and concluded that there was something very unusual about this man. That although he looked like a man, he was more than a man. So Nicodemus came to him and says, listen, no man can do the things you, you do except God is with him. You know, and and he's, he's going on blabbing about Jesus. And Jesus says, Nicodemus, except a man be born again, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. And the man says, what, what do you mean by that? Do you mean I should go back to, the, to my mother's womb and come back again a second time? Jesus says, no. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. That which is born of the spirit is spirit. The spirit moves where he wants to. And then he says so many things. And then in verse 16 of that conversation, John 3, 16, which is the, probably the most recognized verse in the Bible, that in Psalm 23. John 3, 16, we read, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whose Ever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. 
I want you to underline in your Bible or highlight in your Bible or make a note in it if you're reading an iPad with your Bible. Underline the phrase, His only begotten Son. His only begotten Son. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. That whosoever believes in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. His only begotten Son. Three things I want to uh, highlight in this passage. First, we see God's generous love. God so loved the world that he gave. God loved, he gave. Salvation of man was an initiative of God. He's the one who started the, promise, the process to reclaim man to himself. And he did it out of his extravagant love for man. For God so loved the world that he gave. The generosity of God, the love of God that takes the initiative to redeem man. The second thing I want you to note from this Bible is the uniqueness of Jesus. His only begotten son. Not just his begotten son. Only, only. There is none like that. No one before has ever occupied this role. Not Abraham. Not Moses. Not David. Not any of the prophets. No one. No one. Not even Adam was an only begotten son. Adam was a created son of God. But this is God's only begotten son. It's the uniqueness of Jesus. It's a unique role reserved for the word who became flesh. He's the one and only. I want you to note it because I'm going somewhere with this verse. His only begotten son. Everybody say only begotten son. Okay, the third thing you note in this passage is the offer of eternal life. That in this only begotten son, whoever believes in this only begotten son will not perish but have everlasting life. So eternal life or the life of man is linked to this only begotten son. And who is he? He is the word who was with God. He is the word who is God. So really, if you believe in him, you believe in God. In the beginning was the word, the word was with God. So, if you believe in him and what he comes to do, then there is an offer for eternal life. Remember that after Adam and Eve sinned in the garden of Eden, the way to the tree of life was bad. Because God says you cannot take the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, which is sin, and then take the tree of life at the same time. So they took the first tree, the tree of sin. The tree of life was bad. So they have no access to the tree of life. They have access to the tree of sin, but not tree, tree of life. They go out of the garden. The way back to life has been blocked. But God says, if you believe in this only begotten son, then you can go back to the life. He is our tree of life. He is the one who offers us a way back to God. Now, in John chapter 12, verse 20 to 24, Jesus makes certain interesting comments about himself. Now, I want you to follow this. Up until this time, the Bible says he is the only begotten son. He is the one and only. There's none like him anywhere in the world. In John chapter 12, Jesus is about to go to the cross and I quoted the latter part of what I'm reading that is from verse 25 onwards last week. Now I'm going up to the verse preceding what I quoted when I said now is the judgment of this world. Now the prince of this world is about to be cast out. It was from the same passage. It's the same discourse. But for purpose of what I, quote, I was doing last week, I just did a latter part. But now, we're going to see the larger context. So, John chapter 12, verse 20 to 24. I want you to follow this. Now, there were certain Greeks among them, those who had come to worship at the feast. Then they came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida of Galilee. And asked him, saying, Sir, we wish to see Jesus. Philip came and told Andrew. 
And in, in turn, Andrew and Philip told Jesus. But Jesus answered them saying, The hour has come that the Son of Man should be glorified. Most assuredly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the ground and it dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it produces much fruit. Now, this happened after Jesus had entered Jerusalem, what we call the triumphant entry into Jerusalem. He rode and said, Hosanna, Hosanna. He goes, he cleans the temple, and he's in the temple. Uh, and, and these Greeks come, and Greeks were Gentiles. They come, and they, and they tell one of the disciples of Jesus, Philip, and say, we want to see Jesus. Now, if you know who Jesus is, in the beginning, the word, the word is God. The word is God. God became flesh. So they want to see Literally say, we want to see God in the flesh. We want to see Jesus. So Philip goes to tell Andrew and says, Andrew, there are some Greeks here. And they say they want to see Jesus. Now, why is this important? Because they know that Jesus is dealing at this time with Jews. There have been a few non-Jews who have come to Jesus, the Syrophoenician woman, the centurion. But this is a group of Greeks. They're far removed from the Jewish covenant with God. They come and say to Philip, we want to see Jesus. I want you to look at the request they made. The request is, we wish to see Jesus. This is a very simple request. We wish to see Jesus. They've traveled a long way. They've come to the temple. They probably saw the coming of Jesus into Jerusalem. They probably saw the cleansing of the temple. They probably thought, this man must be powerful. They say, we want to see Jesus. The simple request to that, if somebody comes and says, we want to see Jesus, you would expect Jesus to say one of two things. You expect Jesus to say, okay, bring them. I want to see them. Or, I'm not ready for them. I don't want to see them. I mean, that's simple. Because it's a simple request. I want to see Jesus. If somebody comes to uh, the office and sees uh, my, the reception and says, I want to see Pastor Otabel. That's not the time to quote all kinds of prophecies and, and, and give him a, a deep word. You just say, but you can go and see him or he is not ready to see you now. So simple. We want to see Jesus. Simple request. Simple answer should be, come and see him or he's not here. But then Jesus goes into talking in parables. And then after he talks in parables, if you read the rest of the story, Thunder, strike, I mean, there is a voice, and, 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 and the people thought it had thundered, and, and Jesus said, well, that is the voice of the Father, and then Jesus starts talking about the judgment of this world, and, 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 and the prince of this world about to cast it. Now, why is it that this simple request, we want to see Jesus, will provide and produce such dramatic answers? I mean, it, it shouldn't be something that is, is either he's there or he's not there. We want to see Jesus. But Jesus responds in a very unusual way. He actually doesn't even respond to the people who say they want to see him. He's now speaking as if he's talking to himself. So let's look at what Jesus said. Let's look at his response. If you go back to verse 23, John 12, 23, Jesus says, The hour has come that the Son of Man should be glorified. Now, we want to see Jesus. The hour has come that the Son of Man should be glorified. It, it doesn't seem like an answer to the question. Do you think so? We want to see you, Jesus. The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. What is it about the request? And then he goes on, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the ground and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it produces much grain. Two things here I want you to notice. First, Jesus talks about the Son of Man being glorified. Normally when he says that, it has to do with his death and resurrection. So Jesus is saying the Son must die and resurrect. The time has come for the Son, the only begotten Son, to die and be resurrected. That's the first thing he said. 
Secondly, he talked about the seed of wheat. He says the seed must produce much fruit. The seed must also die and produce fruit. We want to see Jesus. The son must die and resurrect. The seed must also die and produce much fruit. Now, the word that is translated a grain of wheat in the, in, the, in the Greek is seed. Seed. So, Jesus said a seed of wheat. A seed of wheat. And uh, if you look at some of your translations, it says it produces much seed. Much seed. Or much grain. But when you look into the original Greek, the word that is used, the seed, the grain of wheat, is not the same word that is used, much seed. The word that is translated as much seed is much fruit. So actually, if you read the Old King James Version, it renders this more accurately. Except a seed of wheat falls into the ground, it abides alone. But when it is planted and it dies, it will produce much fruit. So Jesus is talking about seed and fruit. So, what is all this about? I like how the Amplified Version puts it. It says, I assure you most solemnly, I tell you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains just one grain. It never becomes more, but lives by itself alone. But if it dies, it produces many others and yields a grain, a rich harvest. A grain of wheat is whole, it is unique by itself, it is self-sufficient. So, if you want it, you get one grain of wheat. But if you want a bowl of wheat, you can't eat one grain of wheat. If you want a bowl of wheat, you need a lot more wheat. For that to happen, that one seed must be planted. And when it is planted, it is going to produce a lot more for you to have a lot of wheat. I hope you follow the picture. So the people came and they said, we want to see Jesus. Jesus is about to go to his death. Now, can you imagine Jesus dies? He resurrects and goes to heaven. Now, when people say, we want to see Jesus, whom are they going to see? No one. Because the one who is the only begotten, the one who is the seed, the one who is the grain of wheat, is gone. So Jesus is saying, before I go up, I'm going to do something dramatic to myself. I am the grain of seed, of, of wheat. I am going to die. I'm going to be planted. And when I plant, I get planted, I am going to produce other grains of wheat. So whatever I am as a unique person, I am going to multiply it. So that when people come and say they want to see Jesus, it's not going to be me. There will be so many like me all over. And actually, they don't have to travel all this way to come and see me. When they say we want to see Jesus, they can see Jesus wherever they are. Because I'm going to multiply myself. Because up until this time, he is the only begotten of the Father. He's the only grain of wheat. But he says, I will plant myself. And when I plant myself, there's going to be a harvest. And when people come looking for Jesus, and I'm not there, there will still be a lot of Jesuses they can see. This seed is going to multiply itself. Now remember, he is the only begotten. He's going to be planted. So, he's not going to produce slaves. If a son is planted, a son must be harvested. The nature that is planted is the nature that becomes the harvest. I want you to follow that closely. Now, when you go to John chapter 10, chapter 1, sorry, verse 10 to 13, Jesus, or John, says something about Jesus. And I'm going to throw 
in before I move forward. Talking about Jesus, this is what John said. He was in the world. And the world was made through him, and the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own did not receive him. But as many as received him, to them he gave the right, I like that, that word, the right or the power to become children of God. To those who believe in his name, who were born, not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor the will of man, but of God. Now, it says, those who believe in him, the only begotten, gotten, the only begotten will give them power to become children of God. Who were born. Everybody say born. Now, he says who were born, and he tells them what they were not born of, and then he tells them what they are born of. Who were born of the will of flesh, the blood of man, but of God. So if you cut the parenthesis, not of will of flesh and so on and so on. Who were born of God. So, this only begotten, he has the power to create other sons of God or children of God. All right. So, if the son empowers others to become children of God, then how does he see these people? How does Jesus see all the people he allows to share in his relationship with the Father? Now, won't you now, we're moving from John and go to Hebrews chapter 2, verse 10 to 11. And I'm going to, this is a heavy passage, so I'm going to unpack it slowly. Hebrews chapter 2, verse 10 to 11. Hebrews chapter 2, verse 10 to 11. Are you there? It says, for it was fitting for him, for whom are all things, and by whom are all things, in bringing many sons to glory, to make the captain of their salvation perfect through sufferings. For both he who sanctifies and those who are being sanctified are all of one, for which reason he is not ashamed to call them brethren. This verse is very, very loaded, so I will unpack it for you. First, there, if you read, look and keep your scriptures in that verse, because I'm going to do some work on it, there is a mention of someone that is described as for whom are all things and by whom are all things. Now, who is that for whom are all things and by whom are all things? Now, if you go to John chapter 1, we just read it. It says, all things were made by him. So, the one for whom are all things and by whom are all things is the word, Jesus. He's the one. So, it says, it was fitting for him, for whom are all things, by whom are all things. So, so we can just simply paraphrase it and say, it was fitting for Jesus. It was fitting for Jesus. Because that whole paragraph uh, uh, phrase, for whom are all things, is just talking about Jesus. So, it was fitting for Jesus. Then the second thing you would notice is that he's called the captain of their salvation. So Jesus is the captain of our salvation. That means he is the main person leading the effort of bringing the salvation to man. For it was fitting for him, for whom are all things, and by whom are all things, in bringing many sons to glory to make the captain of their salvation perfect through sufferings. That simply means Jesus is the captain of the salvation and in order to save us, he did it through suffering. I hope you're following that. Now the mission, the Bible says, in bringing many sons to glory. The captain of our salvation suffered. Why did he suffer? He suffered to bring many sons into glory. 
Now, I remember when we read in John chapter 1, verse 14, when it's talked about the word became, becoming flesh, it says, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory. Whose glory? The glory of the Son. So Jesus had a glory. If you saw him, you say, wow, that's the Son of God. Oh, the glory of Jesus. He walks on water, he heals the sick, and he does all these profound things. And what was that? That is his glory. Now, here in Hebrews, he says, it was fitting for Jesus in bringing many sons into glory. So Jesus did not just come to die. He came to bring sons into glory. The question is, what glory? The same glory he had. The same glory he had. He came to share his glory. Next, if you look at Hebrews 2.10 again, it says there are two things. Descriptions. There is a reference to two kinds of people. It says, first, there is he who sanctifies. He who sanctifies. Who is that? That is Jesus. He's the one who sanctifies. To sanctify is set apart for special purposes. It means to be separated from sin, dedicated to God. Jesus is the one who sanctifies. Then, there's a second description. Those who are being sanctified. Now, who are those who are being sanctified? The believers. So, he who sanctifies is Jesus. Those who are being sanctified is the believer. So, two groups. There is Jesus. There is the believer. He's the one sanctifying. We are the one being sanctified. Now, on a normal basis, if you see Jesus and you see yourself, you say, we are not the same. Jesus is the son of God. He's the only begotten of the father. When you see yourself, you say, I'm just a man. But according to Hebrews, that is not it. It says, both he who sanctifies and those who are being sanctified are all of one. That means he who sanctifies Jesus and the believer all have one root. They have one root. They come from the same source. They are all of one. They are all of one. All of one. He who sanctifies, those who are being sanctified are all of one. Now, if I come to you and I am working with somebody and you say, who is this person? And in describing him, I, am, I tell you that we come from the same parent. Then who is that person? Huh? If the person is a man, he's what? Oh, you don't... I'm working with somebody. And you say, who is this person? And I say, we all come from the same parents. He's my what? If the person is a lady, and I say, you say, who is this lady? And I say, we all come from the same parents. He's my what? Sister. So when the Bible says he who sanctifies and those who are sanctified are all of one, it means those who are being sanctified and he who sanctifies are what? They are what? They are all from one. If they all come from one father, then he who sanctifies Jesus and the believers who are being sanctified, they are what? Follow me carefully. I come to you and I say, you say, who is this man? And I don't tell you my relationship, but I tell you where we are coming from. And I say, we're all from one parent. That man, we're all from one parent. So he's my what? My brother. If he's a lady, he's my sister. So the Bible says, he who sanctifies, who is that? Jesus. Those who are being sanctified are believers. They are all from one parent. So they are what? brothers and sisters. And so the next thing that the Bible says, for that reason, he is not ashamed to call them brethren. So he who sanctifies and those who are sanctified are not just two different people. They all come from one parent, so they have one relationship. They are brothers and sisters. And the Bible says, for this reason, he is not ashamed to call them brethren. 
Do you see what has happened now? In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word was God. He was in the beginning of God. All things were made by Him. The Word became flesh and dwelt amongst us. We beheld His glory. The glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. One. One. Jesus says, before I die... This one is going to plant himself. And when this one plants himself, he's going to produce wheat like this one. Hebrews is saying that Jesus and the believer all come from one source. And so he is not ashamed to call them brethren. Are you following that? So Jesus is not just the son of God, the word of God. He's not just our Lord. He's not just our savior, he's also our brother. Jesus is my brother. Now, if he's my brother, it means that the relationship is deeper. A savior can save you and you have no relationship with him. But a brother who saves you, he saves you and you have a relationship with him. It also means that the father is going to extend the same privileges he gives to the only begotten to the others who are his brethren. I want you to take it from there and let's go a little further. Okay. Now in John chapter 17, it's now getting exciting. John chapter 17, verse 20 to 23. Jesus is praying and, you know, we call it the high priestly prayer of Jesus. He's praying his last prayers. And I want you to listen to what Jesus says. And bear in mind what Hebrews says. Both he who sanctifies and they who are being sanctified are all of one. For which reason he's not ashamed to call them brethren. Listen to what Jesus prayed for. John 17, 22, 23. I do not pray for these alone. That is his disciples who were there. But for those who will believe in me through their word. That is us. We believed in Christ through the word of the disciples. Verse 21, that they all may be one as you, Father, are in me and I in you. So the Father is in the Word, the Word is in the Father. That they also may be one in us. So not only is the Father in the Word and the Word in the Father, but we are also going to be in the Word and in the Father, and the Father is going to be in us and we in them. That they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that you sent me. And the glory which you gave me, the glory which you gave me, I have given them. That they may be one just as we are. I in them and you in me, that they may be perfect in one. That the world may know that you have sent me and have loved me as you have loved them as you have loved Hebrews says, in bringing the sons into glory. What glory is he talking about? Jesus explains it. The glory which the Father gave to him, Jesus says, I have given the same glory to them. In other words, the way God related to Jesus when he was on earth physically is the same way God relates to you after you come into Christ. The same glory. The same glory. It's not a different glory. The glory... I have as a son, I have given to them. Now, if that being the case, we read Jesus is the only begotten son. Now, when he dies, he produces children of God after him. He who sanctifies, those who are being sanctified are all of one. So what happens to Jesus? Is he now still the only begotten of the father? Now look at how the Bible describes the relationship later in Romans chapter 8, verse 28 to 30. Romans 8, 28 to 30. It says, and we know that all things work for good to those who love God 
Those who are called according to his purpose, we quote it all the time. Verse 29. For whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. Why? That he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom he predestined, these he also called, whom he called, these he also justified, and whom he justified, these he also called. But I want you to know the verse 29. For whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, that he who, the son, might be the firstborn among many brethren. Now when we read in John 3, 16, it's the only begotten son. When you read in Romans, he is not the only begotten son. He is the firstborn amongst many brethren. So what has happened? The only begotten son now has brothers and sisters. So when God looks at him, he doesn't see him as the only begotten son. He sees him as the firstborn of a whole line of children that he has produced. So there's a firstborn, there's a secondborn, there's a thirtieth born, there's a thousand born, there's a million born, there's a billion born. I don't know your birth line, but somewhere you were also born. And that one who was the only begotten of the father now is the firstborn in your family. The Savior has become the leader of your family line. If the father would listen to the firstborn, I can guarantee he will listen to the thousand born as well. If the father will answer the prayer of the firstborn, he will come down the line and he will listen to your prayer as well. That's why he says, the glory that you gave to me, I didn't keep it to myself. I said it to all my brethren. May I suggest to you, brothers, you are not just a Christian. You are not just a, a you know, some nice muzu muzu Christian walking, walking. No, you are part of a line of royalty. You are part of a line of people. The firstborn is called Jesus, and you bear the same blood, the same life, the same spirit, the same father, the same glory. So when the believer is praying and he's going to the father, he says, Father, I come to you in the name of my firstborn, the firstborn of our family, Jesus. And the same glory and privileges that the father gave to the firstborn, he gives it to everyone who comes in his name. You are part of that royalty. The life God has called us into is a life that conforms to the firstborn. So, let's conclude the matter now. First John, chapter 3. It says, Beloved, what manner of love the Father has bestowed on us that we should be called children of God. Therefore, the well does not know us because it did not know him. Beloved, now are we the children of God. Everybody say, now are we the children of God. And it has not yet been revealed what we shall be. But we know that when he is revealed, we shall be like him. For we shall see him as he is. And everyone who has this hope in him, everyone who has this hope in him purifies himself just as he is pure. Behold, now, Are we the sons of God? God completes what he started in the Garden of Eden. Adam and Eve missed it, but Jesus comes and he becomes the firstborn. So Adam is no longer the firstborn 
of the believer. Adam is the firstborn of those who are in the flesh. But for those who are in the spirit, the firstborn is not the first Adam, is the last Adam, and his name is Jesus. He leads a whole new line of people who live on this earth. And the Bible says, our future is glorious. First Peter chapter 2, verse 9 to 10, and that's my concluding verse. But you are, but you are, but you are, but you are. Everybody say, I am. I am. But you are a chosen generation. A royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people, that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light, who were once not a people, but are now the people of God, who had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. You remember what God said to Moses when Israel was encamped in front of Mount Sinai? He says, Moses, tell the people to come and meet me. And he says, I want all of you to be a nation of priests. I don't want mediator. I want you to come. I want to talk to all of you at the same time. And, and then there was thunder and fire and all of that. Remember that? And the people said to Moses, hey, this is dangerous. So you go. And we'll stay here. So from then on, they removed themselves from God. And there was the need for somebody to speak to God on their behalf. But then, when you read what First Peter says, he says, you are a royal priesthood. God achieved what he intended to achieve right from the beginning. Now, what does that mean to be a royal priesthood? In, that simply means that you don't need somebody to stand between you and God. You don't need a pastor to mediate between you and God. You don't need a priest to mediate because you are also a royal priesthood. That, that's why when people say, when Christians pray through Jesus, we don't pray through Jesus. We pray in his name, but not through him. In other words, we don't pass our prayer to Jesus. Then Jesus catches the prayer and then takes it to the Father. No, no, no. no. We say, Father, I am Mensah Otabel. That's my name. That's what my Father came, gave to me. But when I come to you, I don't come as Mensah Otabel. I come in the name of Jesus. So at this time, my name is Jesus. And so I ask you. I ask you, I need a breakthrough. And so the father looks at me. And he's not dealing with Mensa Otabel. He's dealing with Jesus because I have come in his name. We are a royal priesthood. The newborn believer can do that. When you stand before the father, he sees you as the firstborn, the only begotten. The word become flesh. The one who created all things in the beginning was the word. The word was with God. Lift up your hands to God. And just thank him for such so great a salvation. And thank him for what he's done in our lives. And thank him for the precious gift of Christ Jesus. For our salvation, our relationship. Thank him for what Christ did. Just say, Lord, I thank you. Oh, I'm a child of God. I'm born again. I thank you for Jesus. I thank you for his blood on the cross of Calvary. I thank you for the pain he bore. I thank you for his suffering. I thank you, Lord, that he shared his glory with me. I thank you for the new life I have in him. I thank you, Lord. I thank you. I give you praise. Oh, worship him. We love you, Lord. Jehovah, we worship you. Jehovah, we worship you. Jehovah, we worship you. Jehovah, we worship you. Jehovah, you are Lord. Lord, Jehovah, you are a king. Oh, thank you for your grace. Thank you for your mercy. Thank you for your goodness. Thank you for your love. Jesus, thank you for your suffering. Thank you for your sacrifice. Jesus, thank you for coming. Jesus, thank you for dying. Jesus, thank you for lifting me up. Jesus, thank you for sharing your glory with me. Jesus, thank you for sharing your name with me.